And with that out of the way, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We're so honored to have her. Dr. Gloria Cuadras is an associate professor of sociology in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies at Arizona State University. Most recently, she is co-editor with Dr. Luis Placencia of uh, the publication Mexican Workers and the Making of Arizona, there it is right there, uh, published by the University of Arizona Press in 2018. In 2013, she was awarded the Dan Schilling Public Humanities Scholar of the Year Award by the Arizona Humanities Council, largely for her work on the Mexican Americans of Litchfield Park Oral History Project. Uh, so she serves as a research consultant for the Litchfield Park Historical Society and Museum. Um, and her partnership with our organization's Oral History Committee has contributed, has made a huge contribution uh, to documenting the lives of the Mexican community of the Southwest Valley. So we are so pleased and honored to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gloria Plaza. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Uh, I want to thank the Litchfield Park Historical Society for inviting me to share some of my work. Um, a special thank you to Judy Cook and Lisa Hegarty for um, organizing and publicizing this. So this is a great crowd, so thank you for taking time out on your Thursday morning to be here. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm not working from my laptop, and so Hopefully this, this will continue to work here. Um, I would like to begin, be careful about who asks you out to lunch, right? <laughs> because before you know it, uh, <clears throat> you may spend the next 10 years of your life involved in a project, right? Uh, and in this case, a study um, that has certainly come to be a, a, a sort of a project uh, of my heart. But uh, Dr. Jose Leiva, Many years ago, we were involved in a Chicano organization for higher education here in Arizona. And we said, let's have coffee, let's have lunch. And, and then in the course of the conversation, he said to me, I would like you to meet. Um, there's a group of women in Litchfield Park who are wanting to document the stories of the Mexican community who lived in the camps and worked for Southwest Cotton Company and Goodyear Farms. And they're, they're not sure how to go about this. And I had happened to, t to tell him that I had just spent two weeks in New York at Columbia um, studying um, and, and, uh, at an oral history training institute. So he nabbed me, uh, and I met uh, with these women. And um, uh, Sarah Homan, who is here with us today, um, Belen Soto Moreno, Sonia Hendricks, who has passed and is dear to all our hearts. Um, and then later, Judy Cook joined us, and she took you know, the Historical Society uh, to, the, to the kinds of polls that you heard about earlier. Um, so I had a partnership with these women. It was wonderful. Um, and in the course of the project, um, uh, just to give you a sense of some of the things that we accomplished with this project, um, we started out small. We got a, a grant from the Arizona Humanities Council, um, and we, we established the project. And out of this project, we collected 50 videotaped oral histories. Um, and since then, I understand, um, we did this like over a period of five or six years. The Litchfield Park Historical Society has continued this. And I understand you have something like 200 interviews now, right, on record. Um, and we produced a film called Voices from the Camps. All, all of these things you can find at the Historical Society. Um, and then we would go to the library at the um, Litchfield Library, and I would bring my scanner from the office, and we digitized hundreds of photos um, and tried to document who was in these photos. And then we had a photo exhibit at the ASU West <coughs> Campus. Um, and then at one, and, and then at during the early part of the project, we organized a Founders Day reunion. And what we did is we um, 
uh, had a camp reunion. It had been 20 years since the camps had closed. And, um, and so we expected maybe 200 people would show up. We held it at the, um, at the gym, at the local elementary school there in downtown uh, Litchfield Park. And um, before we know it, before we knew it, uh, we were out of chairs. We had to order more lunches, remember that? And we had 500 people show up. Yeah. 500 people. And they came from out of state, they came from different parts of the valley, and they came in families. And I have some pictures of sort of, you can see that there's at least three generations uh, of families that showed up, right, to be a part of this, um, this reunion. And we showed the film uh, that used some of these oral histories um, to tell the story about uh, the people who worked and lived uh, in Litchfield Park. Um, and so, <clears throat> At some point, we also worked with uh, students at Agua Fria High School, and we created, and the students created another video on the sacred places of Litchfield Park. So there, we focused on the churches and the cemetery, right? Uh, and those places that have a tremendous amount of meaning uh, for the residents. So um, I titled this talk "Adobe by Adobe." Um, and, and, and choose to begin uh, with Anita Vicera. Um, she was one of the first individuals we interviewed. She was 89 years old when we conducted the interview. Uh, she was born in 1917 in Las Prietas, Sonora, Mexico. And, and she had a story that, um, um, that in, when I teach Chicano history, where you, you know, we talk about you know, the history of the Mexican community and the mining industry, right, and then um, cotton, citrus, and other uh, key crops uh, in Arizona. Um, there is, Lisa, there's a, uh, yeah, there's something here that I can't address. Uh, So Armida's family eventually found her way uh, to this area, uh, to Litchfield Park. And, uh, but like many of the families, you know, her story had tremendous highs, tremendous lows. Tra her father died when she was five. Um, and so then the mother um, uh, got together with extended family and they migrated, right, for work and to be able to subsist. And so this particular <clears throat> clip talks about um, when they left the camps and settled in Avondale. So in many ways, even though the stories we, we collected were based on people who had lived in the camps, in many ways, these are all, this is also the story of Avondale. This is the story of Tolleson, of the Southwest Valley. Uh, because these are, this, is, this is the area where these families settled. So let's hear briefly uh, from Admira. While she's doing that, let me share with you what she said. Okay, and that's a clip. Um, so I asked her, tell me about the family that you started, um, the family that you and your husband started. She says, we built this house, adobe by adobe. And the other day, you know, my son bought a house in Palm Valley. They wanted us to buy his house. And I said, no way. And my grandson that lives with me now, the one that called, he said, Nana, don't you want to keep up with the Joneses? <laughs> she said, and I said, no, I'm going to die in this house I built. I'm going to die here. But Nana, uh-uh, don't but Nana me. If you don't like it, you can go with your mom. <laughs> so I asked her, so when did you build this house? She said, about 1948. We used to come from Litchfield. We were supposed to buy land where Dyser is now. We'd be rich now. <laughs> but then he came over here and he saw, because we were supposed to be about four houses. So he said, no, we better get over there. So we bought it here, $300 for each lot. And so we started 
we first built a little cabin there, and then I had a wood stove, and they put it out there. So every Saturday and Sunday, they come, and my mom and my aunt, they cook, and we'd make the adobes. My uncle taught us how to do it. So we built this house, and that one, and that one, and two across over there, and one where they're, they are building a new one. And that's where the cliff is. Tell me about your own family, the family <coughs> you and your husband started. <laughs> we, we built this house, Adobe by Adobe. And the other day, well, when my, my son bought a house at Palm Valley, my, uh, they wanted us to buy his house, and I said, no way. And then my, my uh, grandson that lives with me, now the one that called, he said, Nana, don't you want to keep up with the Joneses? And I said, no, I want to die in this house. I don't I want to die. Just but Nana, don't but Nana me. If you don't like it, you can go to your, with your mom. I'm staying here. In fact, she wanted, we were going to, we were supposed to buy land <laughs> where Dysart is now. That's where we be rich now. <laughs> but then he came over here and he saw, because uh, there was, we, we were supposed to be about four houses. So he said, no, we better get it over there. So we, we bought it here, $300 for each uh, block. And so we started, we first built a little cabin there, and then uh, I had a wood stove, and they put it up there. So every Saturday and Sunday, they'd come, and my mom and my aunt, we, they'd cook, and we'd, we'd make the adobes. My uncle taught us how to do it. So we, we built this house, and that one, and that one, and two across there, and one where they're building a new one over there now. And so... Forgive me if I do it, um, if I'm a little rushed, while sort of giving you the context for it. Um, but I want to look at when, you know, when Goodyear came into Arizona, and I want to look specifically at the early boom and bust period, um, the establishment of the company town. And, and in doing so, sort of give you a sense of how was it that people of Mexican descent came to be a part of this whole enterprise, right? How were women a part of the very first group of workers um, that were recruited to work in the cotton industry? Right? Um, and so these are the questions that I have. How were Mexican women central to the economic and cultural life of the company town? Um, and how did their work directly and indirectly benefit the company town and the women and their families? And what, so, well, what kinds of works did they do? And so as I was going through the transcripts, you know, I just sort of kept taking notes on the different kinds of work. I can tell you that it is not comprehensive. Um, uh, history is being constantly rewritten. And if there are any of you in the audience who have stories and oral histories that you would like to share, and you have not had your interview done, by all means, contact the Historical Society so they can document your story and your family's story. Um, but what focus on women? Well, as it turns out, about 70% of the interviews that we got were with women, okay? And um, they were the ones who came forward. Um, and, um, but women um, uh, have far too often been erased from the historical record, right? And it's hard to find records at times in the archives about what women's lives were like, what their experiences were like, what were their contributions, right? what were their challenges. Um, and this has gotten better, right? This has gotten better. Um, when Chicano <coughs> Studies and Mexican American Studies programs were established at the universities in the 1970s, we then began to generate um, the scholarship that would allow us to do this kind of work. Um, but I believe I would not 
be inaccurate in saying even today I think we have less than a hundred uh, Chicana historians in this country. I, I believe the last time my colleagues uh, counted it was like 44. Um, and so they are few and far between. I'm a sociologist, not a historian, um, but, um, but in that discipline we continue to be very underrepresented. Um, and then I want to turn to some of the clips. I went ahead and extracted some of the clips that, that um, encapsulated the experiences that women had in relationship to work, um, to their work lives. So I, um, uh, Anida Vicera, Nikki Salazar, Amelia Cabrera, and Connie Mesquita are the women that you'll hear from in the second part of my talk. Okay. And then I'll, I'll leave sort of my analysis for the end and, and invite you to join in on, on sort of, you know, what, what are the takeaways and, and what is the meaning, right, and significance of, of documenting these women's lives. So, uh, from 1917 to 1986, hundreds of Mexican workers and their families lived in the camps of Litchfield Park. Uh, initially, uh, we, uh, uh, when Goodyear decided to come into town, they established a subsidiary of Southwest Co Company that later then was renamed, I believe, in 1943, Goodyear Farms. Okay. And so the, the camps were built in the periphery of the town. Um, and when I, I um, looked, the first company town that um, Goodyear actually built was in Chandler, in Ocotillo, in the East Valley. And, and segregation was built into the design of those towns. Now, there are two kinds of periods that we're beginning to sort of lay out here. There was a period between 1917 to 1928, 29, uh, when the camps existed in the center of town, um, and I believe along the airline canal. And then after that, the camps were built on the periphery of the town. And so um, there were multiple generations at times that work um, for these companies. Um, and one of the benefits of working for, um, and I'll just say Goodyear Farms, was that the housing was provided as part of their agreement to work. The utilities were paid for, right? Uh, families were allowed to add rooms to their houses as their families grew. And, um, and there were certain burial rights that were also provided for each of the families. But when I first started working with the group and I was given a little pamphlet on, I think, the story of, of the town, I noticed that very little right, was, was said about uh, Mexican workers and even less about women. Right? And so that was the job that we had in front of us, is how are we going to document this? Right? How are we going to capture these stories? And here's a picture of a sort of typical camp house. Um, it was a wooden house. It was typically 10 by 12 feet. Okay, and it was one room. Uh, and of course, residents talked about how there was very little insulation, right? Um, and, uh, and you can see the windows uh, that were built there. And people talked about sleeping outdoors during the, during, you know, the summer days. <coughs> Right, um, and uh, so this was this was a picture of, of a typical camp house. They did change um, over the years. So Goodyear arrives in Arizona, and um, they they want to grow long staple cotton. Okay. Um, they needed long staple cotton to produce the pneumatic tires, and pneumatic tires were 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 the rage at that time. They were. They provided a little more stability. They made the tires last a little longer. Um, and, uh, and so they come in and they buy, between the East Valley and the West Valley, something like 24,000 acres. Okay? And then later, they also bought some over by Marinete. I think they bought 8,000 acres in the Northwest Valley. Um, so they needed long staple cotton. Um, you have the war, right? We have the context of the war. And there was an embargo on long staple cotton. So again, they were short of you know, getting the, the raw product that they needed. 
And, and then there had been a bold legal infestation in the South. So, um, so Goodyear, and we can't say enough about the significance of Goodyear coming into Arizona. They initially invested one million, then it turned into five million, then 15 million. They helped build the roads, they helped build a lot of the infrastructure that we, that we see today, right, and then we built upon. Um, and they also started providing loans to um, other growers to be able to grow the amount of cotton that they needed. <coughs> and they also, um, there had been other um, uh, cotton associations, um, but um, they helped found the Arizona Cotton Growers Association. And, um, and look, Goodyear was at the top of their industry, and they wanted to make sure that they kept that lead. Um, and so they needed um, cotton not only for the production of their pneumatic tires, but also because there were a lot of war-related goods that um, required uh, long staple cotton. And, and Goodyear was involved in that. Um, so here's a picture, an old picture of a pneumatic tire. Here is a copy of the billboard of Southwest Cotton Company. And you can see, you know, 17,000 acres of, you know, the Litchfield Ranch alone. And you can see here in the sombra, there's two men hiding here under the building. <laughs> okay. um, and so what do they do? They come in, they clear the land. They hire 2,000 men. Uh, and um, I don't know how many, something like 1,200 mules. Uh, to clear the land that we all, of course, so take for granted now, right? Um, it is so developed, right? Uh, but here you're talking about clearing the raw desert and the work that's involved with that kind of, uh, of, of task. Um, but you need workers, right? You need workers. Cotton had to be hand harvested. And um, what were they going to do about um, you know, uh, obtaining the kind of workforce um, that they needed? So, um, uh, and at that time, I have to say, um, between 1910 and 1920, the population in Phoenix tripled, close to 30,000. But the population, uh, the Mexican population at that time, by 1920 was old, the resident population was only about 2,200, okay? And it had doubled from 1910, okay? Um, so they needed workers, and they knew that they didn't have enough workers in the area. And remember, this is still very rural, very underdeveloped, right? So, um, the chapter that I have in here, goes into depth on what we call now the boom and bust period of cotton. Um, but um, the, the sort of the thing that tipped me off was going to the cemetery and reading a passage that uh, mentioned that um, you know the land was cleared with legally imported aliens. And I said, what's going on there? You know, what, what is this about? And in the accounts that I had read thus far, there was no mention of any legislation. Well, as it turns out, this is how, uh, it's extremely important that we recognize um, uh, the importance of what happened during this period. Uh, because I think it sets the stage for a lot, for, for much of the history of Mexicanos here in the US. Um, but you, what's going on is you have nativists, um, largely um, who were interested in restricting immigration at that time from Southern and Eastern Europe, right? And so to kind of curb that flow, they um, uh, imposed a literacy requirement and a head tax, right? But this had consequences, right, for what was going on in the Southwest, right? Um, and, and the, the idea was that um, uh, there was a law in the books, the Foreign Act, an 1885 law, that forbade 
uh, the recruitment of foreign workers for U.S. jobs. It was not legal to contract foreign workers, okay? Um, but as you can imagine, here, you know, Arizona achieved statehood in 1912. They're trying to sort of establish large-scale commercial agriculture. They're trying to sort of find different sort of economic uh, uh, sources of, of revenue. And, and so the agricultural interests were very opposed to this legislation. So what happens? Goodyear president, I found in the archives, you know, papelitos of the telegrams, uh, um, evidence that, you know, he went to Washington, D.C., people from ACGA went to Washington, D.C., uh, and people from the beet industry also went uh, to Washington, D.C. to lobby the Secretary of Labor, Wilson, at that time, um, to convince him to sort of reinterpret the ninth proviso. And what that did is basically it said that um, uh, we were in an emergency situation, right, because of the war, and that they would grant permission to those in agriculture to bring in workers in order to uh, fulfill their needs. Okay? Now, in my work, I talk about this in terms of an elastic supply of labor. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, but um, what this meant is that the Arizona Cotton Growers Association could carry out the direct recruitment of Mexican workers from Mexico. So we went to Mexico to recruit workers. Okay? So put a notch on that. Um, and it is the first time that the U.S. government sanctioned such an arrangement to import foreign workers, right? Um, <clears throat> this would happen again in 1942 during the Bracero program, but the conditions were very different, okay? Um, so what occurs under the ninth proviso? Between 1917 and 1921, there were a a total, now this is the official record, and of course we're always encouraged to critique um, the records, right? There's a lot of things we don't know about these numbers, but it gives us a ballpark that, that in the course of these four years, this is how many workers were brought into the United States. Um, people in the railroad industry also wanted to be able to import workers. Um, and, um, and people from the beet industry were also very much a part of, uh, of this effort. Um, but think about it, at least half of the workers that were brought in were brought in for Arizona, largely for the Salt River Valley. All those workers, okay? This is how important the enterprise was to what was going on in the economy, right? And just to give you a sense of the magnitude of change that occurred between this time, we went from 43,000 acres planted in cotton in 1917 to 230,000 acres. Okay, that's all. That, and the people said that, that they would see nothing but white in the West Valley, right, during these years. All right. Okay, so It's difficult to know how many women, women would have been part of that official count, all right? We do know that individual IDs were issued to heads of household and people over 16 years of age. And we know this largely because some of the archival documents um, that women were very present in this era. And I actually came across it by accident, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we came across it. Um, and women were critical, and why? Because growers preferred to recruit families as opposed to individual male workers. They, uh, and, and part of this, it's in the literature, is called sort of their articulated preferences for a family man, right? And why? They assumed a family breadwinner would be more motivated to work, they would be less likely to engage in labor dissenting activities, right? And it suited growers' paternalism towards Mexican workers, right? 
by recruiting families, then in the ACGA could in effect recruit more workers, right? Because there was only one person that was being counted, right? But they would bring with them their wife, their children, their, their sister, right? Um, and so the family became the unit of production in the common industry, right? Women, aunts, extended family members, and children all became part of the potential workforce that could be utilized to work in the various stages of common production, even though not all of them were paid for their individual work. Um, so women's work often got hidden into the amount of cotton that was picked by an entire family. So in that way, women's work was sort of rendered invisible, right? Um, and, and, and so left them with little protections as workers, right? And children were also part of the workforce in time. Um, and they too ended up um, often unprotected. Um, and, and I'm not sure with you that, as it turns out, right, um, the universe was at work. As I did work, uh, as I continued my research, I discovered that my father was among those men that were recruited. Uh, and he came in 1921 with his mother, even though he was actually 15 years of age. And, and so this, this is also sort of part of my family history. Um, but what happened? Um, there was a boom, right? Um, Southwest Cotton records record profits. The growers make record, record profits. There were businesses and banks going up. The Salt River Valley grew. They generated a tax base. Um, you had roads, hotels, commerce, construction, all kinds of, of, of development um, in the Salt River Valley. Um, and Arizona begins to establish, you know, a serious relationship into the sort of the investors from the East Coast, right, into capitalism. So World War I ends in 1918, okay, and it takes a while, right, but the price of cotton begins to drop in 1920. And what happens, and this is, I think, really part of a very, what I, I see as a very tragic story, when the price of cotton dropped, even though workers had been uh, uh, working in the fields and, um, and expecting their pay, they were abandoned by the ACG. Part of their agreement was that they were to transport workers to and from Mexico. They were also, um, they had also arranged to keep a portion of their wages so that when they returned, they would be given those wages back. Okay. Um, so what we have is we have a crisis and thousands of workers and of course depending on what source you read it's been anything from 5,000 to 15,000 workers that were abandoned during the 1920-21 year. Um, and so the Mexican Council stepped in and this is where you know I found in the archives a 40-page document that documented the stories of the workers who had been abandoned. This is, I'm not going to read it, but this is an example of a woman who was basically, they took the tent out from under her, left her without her wages, with, with her children, um, uh, not knowing how to get back to Mexico. All right. Um, so this is uh, this is how the cotton industry began here in Arizona, um, and. Um, and so what happens after this is that then there was the possibility that what was known as sort of Lynch Bill Grant was going to close, right? And that Goodyear was going to step out of Arizona. They actually didn't. Paul Lynchfield, I believe, had a lot to do with negotiating with the company. They went into receivership. I think Wall Street ended up uh, saving them. Um, but um, they outlast the crisis. They re-diversify agriculture, all right? And they re-diversified um, um, their own production, right? So there was a, as much emphasis solely on cotton. And that's where, you know, you have sort of this cotton company town sort of decide, okay, we're in the area and we're going to be here for a while, all right? 
And so they continued to operate. They could no longer bring in workers through the ninth proviso, uh, but Mexican workers continued as their primary workforce in agriculture. Okay, so what kind of work did women do, right, in this company town? Um, foremost, the hand harvesting of, co of cotton, the harvesting of other crops, onions. Um, uh, we've been talking about working in citrus. Um, and then the domestic services they provided, often for the Anglo families that lived in town. Um, they were child caregivers, seamstresses. Um, later, after World War II, um, and as other companies came in with your aircraft, um, they did assembly work at Goodyear Aircraft. Um, and, and they became um, um, sales clerks and secretaries <coughs> and school aides. Um, and so, let's see. So, let's see. The thing I remember was that in Coolidge, we were picking, uh, uh, they called it short. It was, uh, what, what was the name of that cotton, the big one? And then over here, they, they had Pima cotton. And, and my sister and I, we, we went to pick them. We, we didn't know how to do it. So this family, they, they went with us and showed us how to do it. And the, the thing that I remember most is that when we came out, after we picked the cotton, we just sat down on the end, and both of us just sat down and started crying. Because uh, when we were picking in Coolidge, uh, the ball, you know, was bigger, so we, we would feel the, <laughs> the uh, whatever they call them, a set or whatever bags. And over here, we just got about that much. But then this cotton was, uh, it, it, you waited, it, it was heavier, and, and we didn't know that, so we just sat down there and cried. <laughs> uh, I three, three I think I remember what... This is Amelia Cabrera. Did you have to work in the fields? Or? Oh yeah, all the time. Can you tell me what that was like? Oh, well, I, like, I loved it. This I handle picking cotton, uh, chopping uh, onions. I like those picking cottons. Remember those? Oh, uh, those gusanos, they're going all over your body. <laughs> oh my God. When you carry your, your sack of, of cotton, all those gusanos will crush on your shirt. We used to put handkerchiefs around your faces and wear those big hats. So, because it was really, it was bad, but it was fun. But I enjoyed it, working in the fields. Was that your favorite crop to pick, was cotton? Cotton. Yeah? Cotton, picking cotton. What did you hate? Oh, <laughs> always trying to put at least 100, 100 pounds in there. That would be like, what, $3 probably? 100 pounds at that time. Yeah, so. Do you remember how many hours you worked? What time you went in and what time you cut out? Oh, early in the morning before it got hot. But in summer it gets too hot, so you try to go early as early as you can to all those field work jobs. We all were pecan. We all pecan. My dad used to take us to pecan on the weekends. And then sometimes after school, he used to take us to pecan. Mm -hmm. To come home from work and take us. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you first worked? Oof, about eight years. Eight. I'm about eight years old. You start us all young <laughs> and teach us how to work. Nikki Salazar uh, worked for the Litchfield family uh, at La Loma, and so I wanted you to hear what some of what she had to share about her work experience. Uh, she, 
viniendo a trabajar a su casa. Después que ya murió el esposo de mi amiga, la señora Pablo, entonces le dieron a mi esposo que si quería él venir a vivir aquí a la Roma, había unas casas a la pura entrada del puertón y allí nos vinimos a vivir aquí, trabajé todos esos años con ella hasta que me fui para Valdez. Todavía ando en la bandera batallando y trabajando. <laughs> and she was 93 years old when she was old. Mm -hmm. uh, and they took her, they conducted the interview at La Loma. And so they went on, on the ground and she was able to uh, talk about where she grew her garden. And um, she was, she lived there for many years. I was never able to take from the interview how many years she actually worked. Uh, for the family, but I sense that there were a lot of years. Uh, let's see if this one. Oh, era mi casa de la limpiaba. La era la número dos, la número tres y la número cuatro. Eran cuatro casas. Y luego las casas de los pilotos también trabajaba, limpiaba las casas. La ropa de mi chupillo la lavaba porque él no quería que la cante y se la lavara. Se la lavaba. ¿Se acuerda cuando tenía la tina de lavar? Donde ponía la tina con lejilla y después la lavaba. Yo lavaba en el lavadero, no tenía máquina. Lavaba en el lavadero, pero yo lavaba la ropa y la ponía una tina. Y aquí le echaba el jabón y lo le echaba la ropa blanca que se dividiera y estaba la ropa olorosa, bonita, blanca, blanca, así como la som sombría se miraba la ropa blanca. Sí, um, uh, for Mrs. Sweeney, I would take care of uh, Billy, and for Mrs. Siski, I would uh, work at the house and iron for. Mm -hmm. And then I worked for Mrs. Miss, Mr. Batch. Uh, his, they told me that he was, uh, his first wife was Mr. Litchfield's uh, sister. And then I guess she died and, and he married this other lady and I took care of her. They used to send me to La Loma. Now have you heard about that? Yes. Uh, he, Mr. Batch used to send me there to get some roses. Because uh, they had lots of roses there, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Salazar lived there, and I would, and Mr. and Mrs. Pablos, mm -hmm. and he would send me to go get roses for his wife, and I worked for him till she died. And then I also volunteered at the clinic. They had a clinic, you know, the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Anita probably, in the, in the list that I came up with, probably had almost every job on the list. Um, and here's mm -hmm. what talking well, about. Well, almost everybody in the, in the, but then Dr. Hilton would go to the, and Dr. Penn, Dr. Penn was first. He had the, the office right where the drugstore is now in Lichfield, just across the road. That was his office there. And then afterwards, uh, Dr. Hilton, and whenever somebody was going to have a baby or, or they needed an interpreter, they'd call me and and then when something, when they wanted to call a doctor or whatever, uh, we'd have to go to her house because that was the only telephone they had there. But most of the time they would always call me and one time she got really sick too. And they called me and I had to go call her dad and I called Dr. Hilton and he said to bring, bring her over. And sure enough, he took care of her.
yo extrañaba mucho, porque donde yo me tenía que pagar la agua, la luz, la casa, tenía que pagar por todo. Y aquí no pagaba, le decía la señora Leche, siempre lo que tú quieras. Tenía rosales, le llevaba flores a ella cada fin de semana, flores de, de rosales, unas bonitas flores, muy bonitas flores. Tenía yo y ella le gustaba mucho mis flores. De manera que todo eso me hace sentirme feliz en acordarme de la vida que lo pasé aquí. Now, during World War II, um, the men from the camps, uh, probably the majority of the men went and served in World War II. And so this left uh, work that needed to be done. And, and so the women stepped in. And, um, um, but during this time, because of the shortage of workers, then you have um, the Bracero program. And so when these workers came in, then they became the workforce that uh, the company relied on. Um, but um, in the post-war period, you had good year aircraft and you had the air force base. And so women started to leave agricultural work and work at the assembly plants. And, and, um, and here is uh, Connie. No, I used to work on the fields. OK. And then I used to start packing citrus. And, uh, mm -hmm. And then I came to Phoenix and I started working in the plants. Which plants were those? I worked for ITT Courier and then I worked for um, Gilbert Engineering mm -hmm. and uh, P.F. Gouge. You can see here, here's a picture. In other interviews, the women talked about literally working on their knees uh, for the, uh, the material for the good year went. And, um, and they received higher wages and better benefits there. Okay. So to wrap this up, um, how did sort of women's uh, uh, wage work sort of benefit the company now? Um, their work in the production of cotton and other crops, you know, yielded tremendous profits, right, for the company. Um, it certainly contributed to the success of the cotton industry, the overall uh, success of the cotton industry in Arizona. It's one of Arizona's, you know, the five C's, right? Um, and, and as such, contributed to the overall uh, economic being of the state. Um, and their work also co uh, co cultivated a stability in the workforce, right? That was valued by the company. Uh, and, um, and their work running households, bearing and rearing children, also reproduce future generations of workers. Right? Um, and how did the women's wage work benefit women and their families? They were able to establish roots, a sense of place, right? a sense of, of ownership of place. And their wages uh, were used right? and contributed to their family incomes. Um, and it enabled the families, many of them, to buy property. Uh, many of them brought property in Avondale. And one of the things that I'm chasing down now is sort of what were the rules and regulations in, in the company town around being able to buy property in Richmond. I don't have that answer yet. I hope to look into that this spring. Um, and then they, um, you know, like many families of the 20th century, they sacrificed, they endured, so that their children could have better lives, right? So their children could obtain education, so their children could, uh, could, could not do the kind of hard, laborious, arduous work that they had. And so in that sense, and um, I would like to put one of my classes to, to, to track this down, because um, uh, many of the, of the interviewees talked about, you know, their child was a lawyer, their child owned a business, their child, you know. Uh, so there was a tremendous amount of, of achievement that occurred in the subsequent generations. And it enabled them to create community. Now, the part of, 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 of the talk that I have not been able to address was sort of what we call in the literature the unpaid labor, 
right? And this is the work that women do, right? The housework. You're, you know, cleaning your own house, rearing your children, the gardening. And then a lot of the work in organizing fiestas and barbacoas. Um, and then volunteering, the, the, the church being a very solid base from which a lot of the women were involved. Um, and they, you know, they were very involved in, in, in the little church there in Litchfield. And then when they moved to Avondale, I understand that they also organized to build a church in Avondale. Um, and they would also take, um, um, uh, maintain the cemetery. Um, there were stories about people who would actually would build the coffins. Make, create, you know, sew the lining for the coffins. Um, uh, food vendors, you know, one woman talked about how her mother would sell snow cones at 10 o'clock after the, the men uh, finished playing softball or baseball. And they would come to her house and she would sell them snow cones, right? Um, and translators. And as you heard, I mean, that story, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of translation involved. Um, and, uh, and then you had the work that they also did uh, on a volunteer basis. Um, so women's engagement in cultural, religious, and social activities helped create a social space. It uh, enabled um, them to pass on to their children some of their customs, some of their uh, practices, right? Um, and created and sustained stability and community and cultivated a sense of belonging. And I can't tell you how much <coughs> sort of emotion um, one can find when you sit down and listen to the interviews. Um, and I think Monica Perales in her work on Smelter Town, on a company town around Smelter, talked about how Mexican women took emotional ownership, right, of the work that they did, right? Even though it was hard work, even though it was um, um, often low paid, right? Um, but there is a tremendous amount of emotional ownership that took place of this work. Um, and, and as such, um, we hope that in, in documenting and collecting their stories, that um, we have begun to uh, write a more inclusive history and, and write a history that includes the contributions of the Mexican community here in the West Valley and in, in, in Arizona. Thank you. Get your book. Good on you. The new book. Get the information of Marinette. Marinette. Pardon? Me? A Marinette. Yes, Marinette. Yes, some of the families went from Marinette right. to Litchfield Park. Yes, and the company bought about 8,000 acres there. And um, and then I think it got bought out by the people who eventually built Sun City. Um, as well, I think. Or Del Webb. Del Webb. Del Webb. Yeah. Del Webb. Where, where can I get your new book, Gloria? At Amazon. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank it's you. Amazon. Yes. Yes. Congratulations. I thought that the presentation was very good. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, because the people saw a white sack behind the workers, I was on it because they were uh, being trained to be a picker. So that's my generation. <laughs> you did a nice, very nice job. Gracias. Thank you, Gloria. Gracias. Gracias. Yes, and imagine that, you know, I mean, when I order the 40-pound bag of, of dog food, right, it's 40 pounds and I can barely pick it up. Imagine carrying a sack that weighs 100, you know, carrying it until you reach that 100 pounds, right, and then transporting it to where they're, they're going to be weighing the cotton, right? And then, of course, there were, there were stories about the Pocian Terrones, right? And the cotton bags just to make it a little heavier, right? Uh, and then Becky Reese, in her work on the Mexican-American women, she talks about how um, um, there's very little division for Mexican women between their work and their sort of family lives. And that's why you will have stories and memories about being at the end of the cotton sack, right? Because they would, you know, childcare didn't exist for them. Right? No one was taking care of their children. So, um, so they would bring them with, and that was their way of having supervision over their own children. Yes? Were you able to um, get some pictures from the people that you interviewed and 
have them also available at the ASU Chicago Studies Department. Right. What um, ASU has the copies of the interviews of the CDs of the interviews. The pictures belong to the Litchfield Park Historical Society, but we scanned hundreds of pictures. Yes, because Benenzo Moreno went out of her way and asked each family to, you know, to allow us to scan their pictures, right? Um, and so uh, I think Sarah was the person who organized the pictures in albums for the reunion that we had. Remember Sarah? Uh, and so you would go to Camp 51, Camp 52, and you would find the pictures there. You know, and uh, a lot of emotion. Well, I don't know. This needs your talk, and this needs to be available to everybody. I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I, am, I am working on a book. It's about 60% done. Um, but working with interviews is hard because they are inherently inconsistent. You know, um, like here we know that Nikki worked for the Litchfield family, but we don't know for how many years. Was it for Kinsa? Was it for five? I mean, so there's a lot of missing information. Well, and, right? and having having their uh, their correct names. You know, like sometimes you'll come up with, say, Nikki, and it may be Natalia or something, you know, a, a real name. And I have found in my research of my Chicano family that somebody will be Chica and it's actually Francisca. See, so you know, it's, right. finding, right. it's finding their real names and then uh, right. providing that not only their married name as of under the interview, but right. their maiden name too. Right. Yes. Yes, and I suspect there are many individuals that have yet to be interviewed. Um, and so I, I encourage you to work through um, your historical societies uh, to see that that takes place. We, like I said, we, we had a team of five when we went out. It was myself, Belen, either Sonia or Sarah, and then the student videographer, and then someone else kind of taking notes. Right? And so we would go to people's homes and conduct those interviews. Sometimes they wanted to come to us. And so we set up a room on my campus to do that. Um, but it's such important work. And I can't tell you how many beautiful stories we now have and that we know because of this work being done. How um, long ago was that, that we were interviewing? We, we, were kind of, we went to their house and they came. Yes, it depended. We, we gave them the option of whatever made them the most comfortable. But how many years ago did we go? Oh, we, that was between 2006 and 2011-12 okay. for the first two phases of the project. Yeah. And like I said, since then the Historical Society has been doing even more work on this. And my students, Juventino and, and Elizabeth Martinez, they became part of our team. And they had a lot to do with videotaping uh, and working with us when we uh, taught students at Alabria High School how to do more histories. Yes? This was amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born, raised, went to school, sure. that kind of thing? Yes. Um, I'm from Raleigh, California, Imperial Valley. So when I first, uh, when, when Belen said she was brought into this world by the horseman at our first meeting, so I, you know, I came from an agricultural community. My parents met picking carrots, and large family of eight, working class, raised in the barrio of Brawley, went to the community college, transferred to UC Santa Cruz, and then UC Berkeley, and then um, took my first job here in Arizona, and I've been here more. My hair was brunette, I think, when I started the project. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've been at this a long time. But, uh, Yes, so that's who I am. And, and I was very, very proud to, to be able to make the connections for my own family about, because we always ask them, how did we end up in Brawley? Right? <laughs> you know? And so, uh, um, and, and he always had something against the enganchaderos, and those were the men who were sent by ACGA to recruit the men in Mexico. But they often abused and took advantage of the workers, right, and would charge them for, for things. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, some of those pieces have come together for me, so. I have two questions. So were the kids encouraged to go to school? And if so, is that pretty much where they learned English, by going to school? Yes. 
Um, yes. Um, yes and no, right? It varied on the family and the needs of the family. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting because um, uh, in the Arizona Constitution, I believe, segregation of African Americans was built into, um, into the law. Um, not for students, not for Mexican, not for the Mexican population. Um, however, right, um, there was a practice from what I'm figuring out from the interviews where students would spend the first two years of their education in the public school kind of immersed to learn English, right? And then they were passed on to the regular grades. And so they talked about that. They talked about being denied the ability to speak Spanish. And that is very common trope in the literature, right? Um, but in that sense, I have to say, um, uh, you, know, you see the increasing importance of education. And um, one of the things that, that happened in terms of sort of dividing the interviews is that we have interviews with people who were directly working for Goodyear Farms, right? And whose, father, whose parents or grandparents sort of, they go way back, right? And then there were the people who were the children who had no experience in agriculture, right? But who grew up hearing the parents' stories about working for uh, Goodyear Farms. And so that's how I'm sort of beginning to, to divide the interviews. And, uh, but yes, a, ver a very common story is, uh, is that um, that Spanish was not uh, incorporated right, uh, into the classroom, right? and it continues to be a, a contested issue even today. Right? Uh, changed a little bit in the 70s with bilingual education, uh, but, um, but yes, the narrators definitely spoke about it. So that's going to be a separate chapter on the schools. But I have to I have to uh, learn about the history of how school was established in Richmond. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes. I'm so happy I came, and I also want to say that I worked for Ms. Moreno Peleso for over 30 years. Yes. And she's a great example as well. Uh, Congratulations. Yes. Yes. Belen was amazing. Um, she worked for Avondale Elementary School District, I think, for 35 years. Uh, very dedicated teacher. She could, uh, Belen, Belen. And, and then, interestingly enough, her daughter was named Teacher of the Year, uh, I think, about, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and she has a wonderful story about how she beat out uh, Laddie Core for valedictorian in <laughs> high school, right? <laughs> so she made him salutatorian, and she took the valedictorian. And, and she went to college before Mexicanas were going to college. I mean, it was a struggle for me to go to college. You know, I had to fight my parents just to leave home, right? And so you can imagine Belen in 1954, what it meant for her to go away to school uh, at Northern Arizona. Uh, but she came back and she, she became a teacher that served the Senate for many years. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.